I was in the ninth grade when I learned what a caricature was. It was during freshman English class. And our teacher taught us about how a caricature is a useful device for highlighting certain details of someone or something's character. And about how a caricature can be used in literature and art to help draw our attention to certain aspects of a person or of an institution's identity. But then she told us something that I've not since forgotten, something that at the time I only barely understood. She then told us that as useful as caricatures can be in art and literature, that they can nonetheless be very dangerous when applied to other people. Therefore, we need to remember, she went on that day, that other human beings are not caricatures. But that instead, each individual is a very complex thing, never reducible to one or two specific traits or beliefs or characteristics that they hold. Well, that was nearly 30 years ago that she taught my class that lesson. And all these years later, I remain better for it. And this morning, I promise I have a reason for bringing that lesson up. But I'm not yet ready to talk about that reason. Because instead, I want to now tell you another story. And in so doing, I want to now share with you my really bad attempt at a Scottish accent. Sound good? Okay, here goes. When I was in college, my soccer coach was a lovely old man who decades earlier had been the captain of the Scottish national team. This man had later coached in the English Premier League and then, after having become a Christian, had decided to move to America to coach at my little Christian college. Well, after each game we played, win, lose, or draw, our coach would invite the opposing team to come join us at midfield for prayer. And almost always, the opposing team would accept that invitation. And thus, we'd all huddle up there at midfield and together listen to my team's coach. And each time, he would begin his presentation the same way. He would inevitably say, I appreciate you lads being here today. It was a great game. You gave us a great battle. But the angels in heaven aren't rejoicing over this game. They're not. They're rejoicing over whether we're following Jesus Christ as Savior. You all have no idea to what end it embarrasses April when I do that. <laughs> I can't wait for her to watch this back. It was a great game, he would say, describing the clash of our opposing teams. It was a great battle. But the angels in heaven aren't rejoicing over who won it and who lost it, he'd go on. Instead, they care about whether we are or whether we are not living our lives after the model of Jesus Christ. Well, that was now over 20 years ago. And just like that lesson from my high school English teacher, this lesson from my old soccer coach also made a deep impression on me. However, also like the lesson from my old high school English teacher, I'm not yet ready to tell you about why I bring up my old soccer coach either. You're going to have to hold on a minute for that too. No, instead, I want to shift gears entirely now. And I want us to turn our attention to our gospel text from Matthew chapter 9, where we find Jesus right in the thick of his ministry, walking day in and day out with his disciples through the dusty back roads of Galilee, traveling, quote, through all the cities and villages, as Matthew puts it, teaching and healing and proclaiming the good news of God's kingdom the good news of God's way on earth as it is in heaven. Well, here as we pick up in verse 36, we're treated by Matthew to a particularly rich detail about the people who dwelt in these cities and villages. 
Describing them all, Matthew writes, and I quote, they were like sheep without a shepherd. Like sheep without a shepherd. Which is to say they were lost and anxious. Overwhelmed and overburdened. Directionless and disoriented. Utterly unmoored. Or as Matthew will record Jesus as saying of them just two chapters later, they were, quote, heavy laden. Heavy laden. And uncertain where and how they might find rest. And so having said that, here now is what I find so remarkable about this passage. Here now is what I find so inspiring and so uplifting yet simultaneously so challenging and so convicting about this passage. In seeing these people this way, and seeing these people so heavy laden, and seeing them there like sheep without a shepherd, Matthew says that Jesus immediately, quote, had compassion for them. Had compassion for them. Yes, Jesus saw them this way, running around a hundred miles a minute, searching for any and everything that might give them a sense of purpose and belonging and identity, paralyzed by a sense of anxiousness about what was happening in the world and what they should and what they could do about it. Yes, Jesus saw them all this way, and he was moved to compassion for them. Which leads me to a very important question. What do we naturally do as human beings when we feel compassion for another? What do we instinctively do when we feel compassion for another welling up within us? Or to ask that differently once more, When we feel such compassion for another overcome us, what do we always respond to that person with? The answer? Kindness. Simple kindness. When we feel compassion for another, invariably, we respond to such a one with kindness, which is to say with a very specific, very intentional kind of warmth and empathy and humility and grace. Am I right? So having said that then, listen to me closely here. Here in Matthew chapter 9, and for that matter here in the entirety of Matthew's gospel, And for that matter, all throughout all four Gospels, always we see in the person of Jesus a man who, when seeing those around him anxious and heavy laden, a man who always feels compassion for them all. A man who, no matter who these others were or what troubles them most, Always we see in Jesus a man who never forgot the full humanity of them all and who thus always responded by treating others with kindness. You still with me? Okay, then let me tell you now two more stories. I've recently received phone calls from two different people living in two different places with two very different reasons for calling me. The first is a middle-aged man who owns a very successful business, comes from significant family wealth, and who has more money than he knows what to do with. He also has a strikingly attractive family, and he's well-respected throughout his community. In short, he is the kind of man of whom people are often deeply envious. The kind of man for whom, from the outside looking in, it looks to all the world like he has it all. Like his life is blissful. 
Like whatever problems he might have must be minor at best. Well, the reason this man was calling me that day was to talk to me about how drug addiction was tearing his family apart. And as this man, again, this man who from the outside looking in seems to have it all, as this man was telling me about how opioids had now effectively taken his son away from him, and how this was ravaging his relationship with his wife and with their other children, as this man was telling me this, he began to cry. This great, powerful, wealthy man, there on the phone with me, he suddenly began to cry. Because so much more important to him than his money or his status or his influence, so much more important than that, his family was now falling apart. And he felt there was nothing at this point he could do about it. In other words, he was like a sheep without a shepherd. And that's story number one. Now story number two. Not long after that, I got a call from someone else. From a late middle-aged woman who, while not as wealthy as the man I just referenced, likewise owns her own business and likewise is quite successful. She too is a pillar of her community and she too is someone who from the outside looking in seems to have it all. She drives an impressive car. She always dresses tastefully and trendily. She's always been physically attractive. She's quick to laugh and she is known for the ease with which she smiles. Well, this seemingly happy, upbeat, fully put together woman called me that day to explain to me how her grown daughter is now getting divorced because her husband has been unfaithful to her and how he has now run off and left her daughter alone with their three young kids. And meanwhile, her daughter, this woman went on to explain to me, is now deeply depressed on account of it all, struggling to even get out of bed in the morning. And this woman, her mother, simply doesn't know what to do to help her. Do you follow? She's like a sheep without a shepherd. Her child's life is falling apart, and she doesn't know what to do to help her. And so just like the man from the story I told you before, this woman too, this woman who from the outside looking in seems to have it all together, this woman too, just like that man before her, as she told me her story, she also began to break down and cry. So here now is why I tell you these two stories. Dear family, we seldom, if ever, know what's going on in the lives of those around us. We seldom ever know what others are up against, what others are struggling with, what hurts and fears and shames and insecurities others are facing what others are dealing with and being overwhelmed by behind closed doors. Which is to say, we seldom ever know the extent to which the crowds around us are like sheep without a shepherd. Anxious, overburdened, fearful, weary and heavy laden. We seldom if ever know And here's the thing, and with it the whole point this sermon hinges upon. Because we seldom know it, we therefore seldom, like Jesus, look on others with any degree of compassion. Instead, we too often do that which my ninth grade English teacher warned my class never to do. Which is to say we too often just caricature them. We reduce those around us to one or two visible characteristics, to one or two aspects of their personality that we think we know and understand. 
And then in so doing, we tell ourselves that this caricature is not actually a caricature at all. But this is instead who these people really are. That this caricature represents the fullness of their identity. And so it is that we have that mean neighbor. Or we envy that rich business owner. Or we mock that crazy cousin. Or we disdain that cold colleague. And then we just leave it at that. Seldom, if ever, examining these caricatures. And thus failing to ever even consider that maybe that mean neighbor is still grieving the loss of a child we never even knew about. Or that perhaps that rich business owner is actually on the verge of bankruptcy and is struggling to hold it all together for his family. Or that perhaps that crazy cousin is ashamed because she feels her life doesn't measure up to that of the rest of the family. Or that perhaps that cold colleague grew up in and out of different homes all her life and therefore had to learn early how to protect herself against a harsh and cold world. I trust you get the idea. Yes, just as in Jesus' day, we too walk through our cities and our villages, walk through our very lives, daily surrounded by sheep without a shepherd. Which is to say, daily surrounded by people who, just like ourselves, often feel lost and unmoored and overwhelmed and heavy laden. However, unlike Jesus... We, in seeing these people, often feel not compassion, but rather feel contempt. And thus, rather than do that which Jesus would have us do, which is offer them kindness, we instead too often simply reduce them to caricatures and then just leave it at that. Which leads me finally back to my old soccer coach and to his post-game words to our opponents. If you'll recall, I told you that he'd invite the other team to join us at midfield and then he'd say to them, it was a great game you gave us, a great battle. I can't help it, it's so much fun. And then from there he'd go on to tell them about how the angels in heaven, however, weren't rejoicing over who won our game and who lost it, but over who was living their lives after the model of Jesus Christ. Well, as I said, those words have stuck with me. Particularly his description of our game as a great battle. Because all these years later, those words now make me think of the 19th century Scottish theologian Ian McLaren. Who reflecting on the way we are all at times overburdened and heavy laden. And of how we are all at times like sheep without a shepherd. And of how we are all at times in need of compassion and not of caricaturizing. Yes, I think of Ian McLaren, therefore, who famously wrote, Be kind, for everyone you meet is fighting a great battle. Be kind, for everyone you meet is fighting a great battle. A great battle. Everyone. You see, dear family, as soon as we begin reducing one another to caricatures, we forget this. As soon as we begin reducing one another to caricatures, we forget that others are quite likely wrestling with the same kinds of sorrows and struggles and fears and anxieties that we ourselves are. And therefore, as soon as we begin reducing one another to caricatures, we lose all sense of compassion for one another. And we begin to feel only contempt. And so I say all of this so as to say, dear family, on this particular Sunday, 
When political anxieties grip our country and when we are therefore most apt to reduce others to caricatures, assigning the fullness of one's identity to who he or she happens to vote for, might I remind us, and might I remind us through the example of those two people I told you about earlier, might I remind us through their example that we are never reducible to caricatures. For while that wealthy, well-respected man from my first story may indeed have a Biden-Harris sign in his front yard, and I assure you he does, there inside his house he is crying because the child he loves is addicted to opioids and it's tearing his family apart. Point being, he is far more than a Democrat. He is a human being in need of compassion. Do you follow? And likewise, while that woman I told you about may have a Trump 2020 sticker on the back of her expensive car, and I assure you she does, inside that car she is crying because the daughter she loves has just been jilted by her husband and is now so depressed that she can barely get out of bed to take care of her three children. This woman, you see, is not just a Republican. Far more than that, she is a human being in need of compassion. Do you follow? Yes, as my teacher warned my class all those years ago, as useful as caricatures can be in art and literature, they can be very dangerous when applied to other human beings. Boulevard Baptist Church, would that we today have the wisdom and the empathy and the maturity to heed those words. Would that we, in such a divisive and emotionally charged moment, rather than reduce one another to caricatures, Instead, strive to model the compassion of Jesus, who, recognizing the complexity of the human nature around him, and recognizing that we are all so much more than that which meets the eye, and recognizing that we are all overwhelmed and heavy laden by the trials of this life, who therefore looked out upon an anxious population and offered each person he encountered kindness. Simple kindness. It's an increasingly lost art in our world. But it's an art our world needs now more than ever. Because everyone we meet is fighting a great battle. And as my old coach said, the angels in heaven aren't rejoicing over who wins and who loses their battle, but over who is modeling their lives after Jesus Christ throughout it all. So would that we, dear family, be among those who give the angels cause for celebration. Would that we, dear family, be among those who look upon all others with compassion. Would that we, dear family, be among those who choose kindness over caricature? Would that we, dear family, be among those who labor in kindness daily, trusting as we do that our Lord and Savior was right, that while the laborers of kindness may be few, the harvest can be plentiful. Yes, in a world where everyone we meet is fighting a great battle, our willingness to meet others at midfield with a little kindness. Well, a little kindness like that could begin to turn the world upside down and start the angels rejoicing. And all God's people said, Amen.